Hello and welcome everybody, I am one proper Varian and today I would like to present what I think to be the biggest, most important system behind the upcoming Victoria 3 warfare mechanics. And spoilers, it's not actually warfare. Now before we jump into this, I do want to say that the general gist of my earlier video known as the Crackpot Theory was correct. However, even that video was at best, as the name implies, a complete lunacy. All of my sources were do trust me, and this theory is even more out there. Don't take any of what I'm about to present to you as fact, regardless of whether you think positively or negatively about it. Please leave your opinions in the comments no matter what, but always remember, no hard feelings. It's just a theory and I love developing those. Now let's jump into this. As soon as I read the concept of War Dev Diary, I started thinking about what this system could actually look like. I've been a supporter of rethinking the old warfare system that we've had since Europa Universalis 1 for a long time now, but wanting something different is not actually the same as having concrete ideas. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this. I wondered what the devs may have taken from each previous game to simulate the changes in warfare to give the players the engagement of control without actually having direct control. Then I went to the Victoria 3 Discord server. The link is of course in the description. It is a great place. I started spitballing with the rest of the community. We started to think up many different ways of giving the player meaningful interaction with the frontline. We talked about everything. Micro without micro, so a system in which you give strategic commands similar to Hoi 4 battle plans and that are then executed by the army. We talked about a system of phases, where the struggle for an area similar to diplomatic plays would go through various stages, potentially leaving you with operational choices in each phase. We even talked about a frontline system based on the concentration of troops that are assigned to a frontline rather than to individual provinces. You can imagine this basically as a heat map of troop distribution. There was also a Polish content creator by the name of Plecajoni Lemur, or Crouching Lemur, that came up with their own suggestion for frontline warfare. I highly recommend watching the video and the link is of course in the description, but let's move on. We tried to think of many systems of front warfare that could be cool and interesting and we always were able to think of something that would make it a bad system because, you know, that's what you do to get a really good system, you try to be a worst enemy. After this discussion I headed to bed slightly deflated from not having a single solid concept and against all odds I woke up with an idea that now brings us to this video. If you will, everything that is to follow was once revealed to me in a dream. <laughs> Alright, so here's how it went. Looking at the frontline was the wrong approach, completely pointless. Looking at Hearts of Iron 4, Europa Universalis 4 or Victoria 2 was a mistake. What happens at the frontline sure would happen at the frontline and leave an impact in the war but the real question was why things would happen at the frontline. And the answer can be found somewhere totally different in your society, your economy. So instead of trying to find out how non-micro troop movement can be made fun, I tried to look at what would determine whether my army can win a war in a way that I can influence meaningfully. And where to look if not the stars? Stellaris. Sure, Stellaris still has you micro your fleets and it's a game set in the year 2200 in space, but there are various elements that could fit right into Victoria 3. Let's start from the ground up. What do we know about Victoria 3? We know that technological advances aren't something that just gets implemented and that's that. Victoria 2 did this quite liberally, ultimately leading to you getting things as soon as the technology or its corresponding inventions popped. This is very different in Victoria 3. You can research nitroglycerin, but you need to employ it in your minds as a production method if you want to use it. Sometimes, or so the devs say, it may be better not to change to this production method for various reasons, even if it is further ahead in the technological tree. We also know that generals with zero troops underneath them can exist. You can see it right here in this screenshot that shows Ottoman armies. One is filled with 10 out of 10 units and two are empty, but already exist. Last but not least, we also know that barracks exist that recruit and train the local population into being right proper servicemen of your army. So with that in mind, let's seek similarities in Stellaris. Many military techs in Stellaris require you to implement them by actually outfitting your ships with them rather than simply giving you bonuses. For this purpose you have a ship designer that is much more stomachable than Hearts of Iron Force division designer and lets you choose designs based on whether you can afford them. Is the price too high? Well just leave your ships in the old style and think about upgrading them later. We can also create fleets in Stellaris, even empty ones. These fleets can be filled with templates we created of our ships and are equipped with the weapons this fleet will need. Are you fighting someone that heavily utilizes shields? Use kinetic weaponry for this fleet. Are you fighting someone that heavily utilizes armor? Use laser weapons for this fleet. Last but not least, in Stellaris you recruit and then create units with your star bases. Now where does all of this leave us? Here's how this can be applied to Victoria 3 in a much greater and impactful fashion than it exists in Stellaris. With this system, we would be able to design units similar to Stellaris ship designer, infantry, cavalry, artillery, engineers and so on. We can design mountaineers or weaker equipped units for purposes of being troops guarding our colonies rather than our homelands. 
Sometimes I may research a new variation of a rifle that costs my munition and I might not be able to immediately equip my entire army with it as I am not producing enough ammunition to pay for the higher maintenance cost. So instead of upgrading the entire army I apply this upgraded template only to units that are positioned at a front with a strong enemy. For now only those troops are receiving the better rifles and are getting better at fighting. It matters more to me that I can win that front if necessary than winning a war in my far off colonies so those troops will have the old rifles. If I ever find my economy producing more ammunition I can equip even more units with this upgraded template. Armies would be created by selecting a commander and then similar to the Stellaris fleet manager giving them command of a yet to be filled army. I would then fill this army with templates that I have created and the barracks would get on creating those units similar to star bases. This brings us to the barracks of course. Barracks create units for armies and send them to wherever the army is stationed. They take the manpower directly from the state they are created in, allowing the player to choose which pops fill their armies. This way you could create armies full of servicemen loyal to the state rather than some unruly interest group. All of this leaves us with a system in which the burden to win a war lies with you and you alone, although you do not command a single unit, not a single one. You select what type of units get assigned to an army, where they fight, what enemy they fight and whether your economy is able to equip these armies both before and during the war. You also choose which pops are pulled into your armies, further allowing you to specialize them. It is all in your hands and in the hands of Victoria 3's core game component, your society. Despite not controlling a single unit manually, please take note that I did not even bother explaining how combat happens at all. That is because it doesn't actually matter all that much. The combat system is a result of the actions that you've taken, your logistics and calculations. The system's details related to what the actual front fighting looks like is of course important but it is of a minuscule importance compared to the economics, logistics and demographics of war. Who knows what front fighting will actually look like. It's only of secondary importance as that merely showcases the result of your hard work. The hard work is done in your economy and society. Now you might say, alright, wait a minute. But what about your actual commanders? Great question. Personally I believe that staff colleges, basically war academies, should play a big role. We know that there will be tech trees in Victoria 3 and we know that techs can be spread by virtue of exposure. Let's work with that. Let's suppose that I build a staff college that generates research points for me by employing pops as officers. These officers could then be focused via a production method on researching either doctrines or physical equipment. Depending on my situation I may focus on doctrines that prioritize logistics, cavalry, artillery and so on and so forth. What I focus on should become an integral part of the military forces interest groups understanding of the world and what sort of commanders this part of society creates. Whereas individual commander abilities were still extraordinarily important in the first half of the Victoria 3 time period, later on they fell off and the idea of a central military command that would follow a formalized general consensus regarding doctrines would become the prevailing element of warfare. So what does this mean in gameplay terms? I may want to focus on cavalry early on into the game, research its doctrines and build my armies around it. This would make it so that commanders leave staff colleges with skills focused on a cavalry based army. This may be optimal for the start but as my military is more successful and as the accomplished generals phase into some sort of old guard role in which they put down core elements of my nation's military way of thinking slowly formalizing it I could be looking at a situation in which my generals fail to understand that war changes. Their cavalry tactics that are now enshrined in my military stand no chance compared to advanced logistics technology or even machine guns. This high command rot can be removed by refocusing my war academies but the old guard of the military forces interest group certainly would not like that, view it as an attack on their honor and I might fall out of their favor. With this mechanic Victoria 3 would tightly connect societal issues with staying up to date on military matters. Losing a war may weaken the military forces interest groups clout so much that I could swap them out, remove the rot and try to go ahead with a new doctrine. Hell, it would even mean that military research can be shared with other nations. For example, if a country that knows how to produce a new level of rifles sends its rifles to a nation that does not have that knowledge, the game could allow the second nation to build a limited amount of units utilizing this technology, emulating that the first nation sent better rifles their way. We could even send officers from, for example, Prussia to Japan and vice versa. Prussia's officers could educate the Japanese ones in the Prussian military style, sharing technology with them and allowing Japan to reform its army radically, if the old guard of the Japanese army does not stop them. So I look to the stars for this system, a system in which logistics, anticipation of the enemy and a healthy military establishment create a warfare experience in which the player is in control, without ever touching an individual unit. What do you think? While I believe that something similar to this may make it into the game, always keep in mind, this is just a theory. A game theory. I am one proud Bavarian and I will see you later. Alligator.